books that we do are all based on the library's collections. And since we have nearly 170 million items in our collections, that's a lot of topics we have to choose from. And with the exhibition then, um, I wrote this book, Rosa Parks in Her Own Words, um, as a way to show things that have not been seen about Mrs. Parks, that have not been heard, things that even her friends and family may not have been aware of. At 19, she married Raymond Parks, a barber, who introduced her to civil rights work. And long before she refused to give up her seat on a segregated bus in Montgomery, sparking both the subsequent bus boycott and the modern civil rights movement, she served as secretary of the local branch of the NAACP. But she did so much more than take minutes. She took testimony. Mrs. Parks was essentially a criminal investigator, looking into cases no one else would, talking to victims who would speak to no one but her. She investigated everything from murders, police brutality, and rapes to a lack of school buses for black school children and business owners preventing their staff from registering to vote. To get a sense of where Rosa Parks was coming from, literally, a little background is in order. Her grandmother was born into slavery, and Rosa Louise McCauley herself was born in rural Alabama in 1913. You could say she was an all-American. She had Indian, African, and European heritage. Since her childhood, she had thought deeply about segregation and racial issues. Here is her description of living with segregation. Living in the Deep South, where legally enforced racial segregation in all areas of life was like walking a tightrope across a bottomless pit. There was no solution for those of us who could not easily conform to this oppressive way of life. I would rather be lynched than live to be mistreated. When I was a little girl, not more than 10 years old, I angrily cried these words to my grandmother in answer to a severe scolding she gave me. I happened to quite casually mention that a white boy had met me in the road some days before and said he would hit me. He made a threatening gesture with his fist and at the same time he spoke, I picked up a small piece of brick and drew back to strike him as if he should hit me. He went away without further comment. I don't know why I remembered to mention it later to Grandma when we were in the kitchen. I was not at all prepared for her stern reprimand of, Gal, you had better learn that white folks is white folks and how you talk and not talk to them. I'm mighty scared you won't live to be grown if you don't learn not to talk bigoty to white folks. There are eight photos of Rosa Parks in a hotel suite with a young white woman identified as Jane Gunter. One of the photos noted that Mrs. Gunter was on the bus on that fateful day, December 1st, 1955. It turns out Jane Gunter, who had recently arrived in Montgomery and who was oblivious to the local bus regulations, had offered her seat to Mrs. Parks after the bus driver ordered her to move. It would be another 37 years before Mrs. Parks and Mrs. Gunter actually met each other. We have several handwritten drafts and copies of her will. In her living will and testament, she writes, my funeral expenses have been paid by me to the Swanson Funeral Home, Detroit, Michigan. I request a brief funeral program at St. Matthew AME Church, where I am a member. No long speeches. That isn't what she gets. She lays in repose in Montgomery in St. Paul's AME Church, followed by lying in honor at the U.S. Capitol building the first woman granted that tribute. And back in Detroit, instead of a brief funeral program with no long speeches, she received a seven-hour victory celebration of life at the 4,000-seat Greater Grace Temple Church, attended by former U.S. presidents, members of Congress, and more than 100 honorary pallbearers.